turn with me to Genesis chapter 3. Genesis chapter 3 tonight. Now I'm going to preach out a passage tonight that I've preached out of many times. And uh, there's so much that can be learned from these early passages in our Bible. But we'll be in Genesis chapter 3, verses 1 through 10. And uh, we're going to look at the nuances of the critical spirit. And, uh, and it's not just talking about us having a critical spirit. But if you listen to these points as I preach them tonight, it's also how to deal with a critical spirit. That is someone, uh, many times because of, our, uh, of how we follow the Lord, many times you're going to encounter a critical spirit. And uh, this, this, these uh, points that I'm going to uh, preach on tonight well, can go both ways. And you'll see what I mean when we get into it. But in Genesis chapter 3, go ahead and stand with me for the reading of God's Word. Genesis chapter 3, and starting in verse 1, we'll read down through verse 10. And uh, this was probably the origin of the critical spirit right here in this passage of Scripture. Uh, but what's amazing about it is that you can deal with it. And uh, this will help us to realize what a critical spirit is and how to deal with a critical spirit, whether it be in ourselves or whether we're dealing with it, uh, being, uh, being the brunt of it. Uh, you can deal with it in any way, shape, or form. And so it reads like this, Genesis chapter 3, verse 1. It says, Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the women, Yea, hath God said, Ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden? And the woman said unto the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, Ye shall not eat of it, neither shall ye touch it, lest ye die. And the serpent said unto the woman, Ye shall not surely die. For God doth know that in the day ye eat thereof, then your eyes shall be opened, and ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. And when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree to be, wise, a tree to be desired to make one wise, she took of the fruit thereof, and did eat, and gave also unto her husband with her, and he did eat. And the eyes of them both were opened, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together, and made themselves aprons. And they heard the voice of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God amongst the trees of the garden. Now what's amazing about verse 8 is that means that at one time, mankind walked in the cool of the day with God in the garden. Daily. Daily they communed with God. And, but then look what it says again, verse 8, And they heard the voice of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God, uh, of God amongst the trees of the garden. And the Lord called unto Adam and said unto him, Where art thou? And I always got to pause there and say, Now, you're not, you're not so simple as you read your Bible that when you get there you actually think that God wonders where they're at. If God is the creator of the, of the universe, and God is our creator, certainly he knows from beginning to end, certainly he knew exactly where Adam and Eve were. And what he was doing was, and God does this many times, he's asking for the benefit of Adam and Eve. He wants them to realize where they are. He wants them to question themselves, saying, why are we hiding from God? And so he, he again says, and the Lord, uh, verse 9 says, The Lord God called unto Adam and said unto him, Where art thou? And he said, I heard thy voice in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, and I hid myself. And we're, that's all we're going to read tonight. But in that little passage of Scripture that we read tonight, we can see the origin, the beginnings of the critical spirit. And uh, so we're going to get into that tonight. We're going to look at the nuances of of the critical spirit. Father, we're grateful, Lord, I pray that you bless us and give us a good time in your word tonight, Lord, and speak to our hearts and help us to realize, Lord, that even if we're sitting here and some might be saying, I don't need to learn about a critical spirit because I'm not critical, I just want to follow God, and I just want to do right, and I understand that, but also it can help us to identify critical spirits in others and help us to know how to deal with a critical spirit when it's aimed at us. And so, Lord, I pray that you speak to our hearts. Help us to grow closer to you tonight and uh, help us to learn how we can deal with uh, uh, folks in our world and uh, help us to learn how we can encourage them, Lord, to follow you. And so, again, we're thankful for your goodness and your mercy. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. 
as I said, so much can be learned uh, from these early passages of Scripture. Uh, uh, of course, we know that, that what we're reading here in Genesis chapter 3, it marks the fall of mankind. And of course, it also shows us how sin was introduced into the life of man. And it also reveals the power of temptation. And, it, and, and is the illustration of what the Apostle John spoke of in his epistle, uh, John, 1 John chapter 2, verse 16. Remember that verse where it says, For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. The origin or the, the example or the illustration of that, that passage of Scripture there in 1 John is right back here in uh, Genesis chapter 3. But in this passage tonight, it's revealed, uh, there's much revealed about the devil and how he works. Uh, we see there uh, in, the, in the scripture where uh, the devil is conversing with, uh, with Eve and he, say, yay, and he says, yea, hath God said. And what he did is he caused Eve to doubt God's word and worse yet not to verify God's word. So on that note, what we're looking at is what you're seeing is Satan capitalizing on Eve's lack of and even misuse of information and fostering the origin of the critical spirit. Did you understand what I just said? In other words, uh, what we're seeing is Eve, the lack of and even the misuse of information, that's what creates a critical spirit. Again, it's the lack of and even misuse of information, and it fosters the origin of, of a critical spirit. And, and horrors of horrors, wouldn't you know, the victim of the, uh, the first victim of the critical spirit was God himself. What do you mean by that? What do you mean God was a victim? God was a victim of a critical, a critical spirit. And, and I'm not going to spend any time trying to define or demonstrate what a critical spirit is or does. I think you'll figure that out as we go through this, uh, this little text that we read to you and uh, that I read for you tonight. And, and so what, what brought about the first biblical case of a critical spirit? And like I said tonight, you might sit here and say, well, I, you know, uh, don't, what, I, what I'm encouraging you to do is don't look at it as from one perspective. Don't look at it as I'm, I'm trying to identify the critical spirit so that you guys will know never to do that. But what I'm saying is don't, don't look at it just from that perspective, but learn what a critical spirit is and where it comes from and, and what, how it's developed. That way you'll be able to deal with it too when people are critical, uh, throwing a critical spirit at you. And I guarantee if you're following God's word and uh, you're going to encounter a critical spirit. Amen. And so, so think of it from that direction as well. And so the first thing we can look at tonight is where does a, where does a, how does a, critical spirit come to be? How did it happen here uh, in Genesis chapter 3? We'll look at verses 1 through 3 again, and look what it says. Now, what's going on here is, of course, Satan has come to Eve, and, uh, and Eve has stepped away and is alone, I guess, for a little bit. And what has happened is, Satan seizes on the opportunity uh, to, uh, to try to turn Eve away from God. And how does he do that? Well, the first thing he does is look what it says. It says, Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, so he, he makes contact with the woman. And the first thing he does is he tempts her critical spirit. He, he tempts her to, uh, to be critical towards her maker, to God the creator. How does he do that? Well, look what he does. He questions her. He, he throws a simple little question at her. And it says, And he said unto the woman, Here's the question, Yea, hath God said? It's that simple. It was that simple. It was that little bit of, uh, a little, uh, few words right there that fostered or, or uh, was, was the, uh, the, the beginning of fostering a critical spirit in Eve. Again, it says, Yea, hath God said, and then he says, ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden. And so then it says, and the woman said unto the serpent, we may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, ye shall not eat of it, neither shall ye touch it, lest ye die. And then look what happens. Verse 4. 
His response is, and the serpent said unto the woman, ye shall not surely die. He's more or less saying to her, that's ridiculous. And so what happens is it puts doubt in her mind, and all of a sudden it starts to fester, and all of a sudden, and it doesn't take very long. It's not like she went home and thought about this for a couple of nights or a couple of days or a couple of weeks or a couple of months. It, it, it took place that quick. And, and so what happened is it got her to doubt God's word. Now, what I'm talking about is this. So what brought about the first biblical case of a critical spirit? Well, the first thing is, the first thing we can see it, here is, and you'll, you'll remember this, uh, I've used it before, that it's the dereliction of God's word. Remember what dereliction is? Dereliction defined is, is, is this, an utter forsaking or an abandonment. So what she did is, is Satan got her to question God's word and actually abandoned God's word, you see. So Eve, when she responded to the challenge from Satan, not only didn't she not check herself against a reliable source, what do you mean by that? Well, here's what I'm saying. Here's what will help you as far as is if you never want to be a critical spirit, if you, if you always want to know how to combat a critical spirit, always go back to the source. Because what will happen is, uh, just as I said, uh, uh, a critical spirit will always try to spin from the truth. So Eve, when responding to the challenge from Satan, she didn't check herself against a reliable source. Who is a reliable source? Look at verse 8. Look at verse 8. First part of verse 8, it says, And they heard the voice of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. Now, I pointed that out to you. One of the most, uh, it's one of the, probably the most highlighted verses in all my Bible uh, in, in this part of the scriptures is to realize that they were able to communicate with God every day. I mean, it's amazing to think about. That, that they had, before the fall came into our world, before Adam and Eve sinned, and, and of course we are sinners by, uh, by nature now, um, they had an open relationship with God where they could talk with Him, commune with Him every day. God made it a point to come and commune with Adam and Eve every day and walk with them. That's amazing to think about. Now, how would he have walked with him? Well, he must have been like a, it must have been the pre-incarnate Christ. You know, I, I imagine, I can only imagine what Christ would have looked like, uh, probably like the same uh, when, when, when Peter, James, and John went with Christ to the, uh, to the Mount of Transfiguration. When he said, come with me, I, I want, I, you need to be with me for this. And of course, what had happened is, it talks about how his raiment glowed and, and how he took on a, uh, a persona that he had never had uh, here before. And they were able to witness to it. And of course, what had happened is Moses and Elijah showed up on that Mount of Transfiguration. And what he talked to them about was him going to the cross. And it said his, his, he, he had an aura about him and his raiment shone. And so that's what I imagine it was like. Is, is here's Adam and Eve, just common, ordinary human beings walking down this earth, and here comes Jesus Christ as God, God the Son, come walking alongside them as pre-incarnate Christ. And, and what happens is it says in verse 8, and they heard the voice of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And so, so the first thing that happened that made uh, that, that fostered Eve's critical spirit is that Eve failed uh, in, in, in challenging Satan by saying, before I do anything, I'm going to go check my sources. And she had the ability to do it. In other words, she had God himself. And then they walked with him daily. And it might not have been the time of the day when he came for that walk, but she could have said, either I'm going to wait till tomorrow to ask God about this, or I'm going to, uh, or I'm going to go to my husband. After all, if you, if you read this through and, and really think about it a little bit, what you'll understand too is her husband was given this information. And, and her husband, if, if the question never came up in their daily walks with God, Adam was the original bearer of the law. As far as their law. Now I'm not talking about the Moses' law that he, God had given him, but of the few things that they were told to do. 
Like right there. Look back at uh, Genesis chapter 2. In verse uh, 15 it says, The Lord God took the man and put him into the garden of Eden and to dress it and to keep it. And here was the law that, that Adam was given. And the Lord God commanded. There's the law. And commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden thou mayest freely eat, but of the tree of knowledge, good and evil, thou shalt not eat of it. For in the day that thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. There's the law that God gave Adam. Now, of course, if we read down through that, we know that, that, that uh, Eve was not present at that time. Adam was put in the garden before Eve even came into presence. Before he, 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 she was even taken out of Adam's rib. So, so what we can assume is, uh, at the very least, she had, uh, we'll give her the benefit of the doubt, and say, well, maybe she never heard it from firsthand from God. Well, she, she, they walked with him daily, every day since. So we'll give her the benefit of the doubt and say, well, maybe she never heard it right from God. But then what we know is that she must have heard it from the husband, you see. And, uh, and Adam, because like I said, Adam was the original bearer of the law. And so Eve, when responding to the challenge from Satan, not only didn't check herself against a reliable source, it, she went totally against what God's word was. Satan, here he comes on board. And look at what verse 4 again says. It says again, And the serpent said unto a woman, Ye shall not surely die. Now, what I would have said, and, and what I'm encouraging you to do before you become uh, uh, a, a, uh, a bearer of a critical spirit, or before, before you become the target of a critical spirit, stop right there, Eve, and go verify. Go ask Adam, or if he's not sure that uh, the cool of the day is coming, whether it was the following day or whether it was later that afternoon, the cool of the day is coming. Wait and ask God, you see. Because the problem is, look at verse 1 again. The, serpent tempted, the, the serpent's temptation was to question what God had said. Last part of that verse says, Yea, hath God said, you shall not eat of every tree of the garden. And so you see what I'm getting at. Subtle Satan knew what he was doing. He already saw the seed of doubt. But it's, it's oh so much more than just that. Verse 5 and 6 says, For God doth know that in the day ye eat thereof, then your eyes shall be opened, and ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. And when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was pleasant to the eyes, and the tree to be desired to make one wise, she took the fruit thereof, and did eat, and gave also unto her husband with her, and he did eat. So it's just like what James said in James 1, uh, 1 verse 14. But every man is tempted when he is drawn away of his own lusts, and enticed. And so what happened is Eve desired what Satan was offering. And so the first thing that we can realize when it comes to being a, a critical spirit is how it comes to be is we 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 uh, we derelict from God's word. That means we abandon it, we turn from it, we forsake it. You see, or we 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 derelict the truth. We derelict to convert. You see. And so, and then we also know that Eve desired what Satan was offering. Now, how many with an ulterior motive turn to a critical spirit like Eve's? Because that person wants to justify a certain sin or a belief or a desire or even simply defame the source of their disdain. They won't turn to the truth in God's word, but will turn to sources that support their belief even when they're wrong. Later in my end of my sermon, I'll mention uh, a man that I uh, that I um, appreciate as far as his stand on the Bible. He's no longer around, uh, but but he was the the how would you say it the the target of a critical spirit. Where I've seen many times many examples where men turn away from the truth to slam uh, Peter S. Rock. The man who I learned so much about my Bible from. Not that I'm holding him up on a pedestal. But, but he's taught me, you know, we learn, uh, my boys and I, I believe my two boys that are here tonight, have learned how to appreciate God's word through many of the teachings of Peter S. Rutherford. And, and so the first, that's the first step 
uh, of, of a critical spirit is, is the dereliction of God's word, turning from it. Now here's the second step. The desire to be exalted. Look at Genesis chapter 3, verse 5 and 6. It says, For God hath known that in the day that ye thereof in your eyes shall be opened, and ye shall be as God's knowing good and evil. And when Oman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree to be desired to make one wise. That's the key of it right there. There was more to it than just it was pleasant to look at. It was more than just it looked good for food. But probably the capstone there was it was it was a tree to be desired to make one wise. So what she had was a desire to be exalted. This is always there. It may not be easy to find, but it's always there when you read verse 5 and 6 again. I mentioned earlier, John wrote about this in his epistle. It really is a warning. 1 John in 2.16 says, For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. She saw, she desired. And talk about pride. She's thinking right there, I, I can be like God. I mean, can you imagine what's going on here? That it says in verse 8, they had walked in the cool of the day every day with, with God, the pre-incarnate God. And so they see this beautiful being and the wisdom that he has. And, and they're walking with him and, and he's counseling with them and encouraging them and telling them all the things that they, ever they ask. And so you can see that I don't know if you could say it turned into envy or whatever, but the desire was, man, I don't want to be like that. You see. And so what happened? Well, we see what happened. Again, what happened was in verse 6, and when the woman saw the tree was good for food, and that it was pleasant to the eyes, and the tree to be desired to make one wise, she took of the fruit thereof and did eat, and gave also her husband with her, and he did eat. And so what we see there is the next turn she took was a desire to be exalted. And so you get where I'm going here. The, or, the, the, uh, the nuances of the critical spirit comes out of these things. First, the dereliction of truth, God's word. Secondly, the desire to be exalted. And then look at the third thing, verses 8 through 10. Look what it says. And they heard the voice of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God amongst the trees of the garden. And the Lord God called unto Adam and said unto him, Where art thou? And he said, I heard thy voice in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, and I hid myself. And so that last one is they, they digressed from the truth. We'll read verse 8. Digress. What's that mean? What's digression mean, Pastor? It means deviation or departure from a regular course. And so they turned away from the truth. So get this. Adam and Eve used to walk with God daily. I mean, that's what it says, right, in verse 8. And they heard the voice of God walking in the garden in the cool of day. They walked with Him daily. And, and can you imagine, here's a question I have for us. Can you imagine God walking with you daily? And how, man, that would be nice. Wish we had it like that. And you know what I say? You can. You got it. You have it. Matter of fact, didn't Peter say that, that when he says you have a more sure word, he said, I, I'm witness to God himself. I'm witness to uh, the... Uh, the the not pre-incarnate Christ, but the resurrected Christ. I was I was witness to uh, the oh what do we call it when we when we're when we receive oh the, I'm I'm witness to the glorified Christ because he saw him on the uh, on the uh, the Mount of Transfiguration. But yet what Peter says, I forget if it's in Second Peter or First Peter, but what he says is yet you have it. You have a more sure word than even that. And you know what he was talking about? His word. His Bible. And so when you say, man, that sure would be nice. When we read verse 8, that if God came and walked with us, damn it, he can. He does. If you're reading your Bible, uh, if you're reading your Bible daily, hey, stop that. If you're reading your Bible daily, 
then, then you can walk with Christ daily. Amen? Through the reading of your word, of his word. And then, so what we have to ask ourselves is, how many of us really read our Bibles? I mean, really read your Bible. Not just do a little devotion here and there in the morning. How many of you, you know, how many of you, uh, how many of you really read your Bible? And did you know, and I've said this before, you can tell somebody that reads their Bible. All you gotta do is pick it up and look at it. Just, just leaf through it real quick. All you gotta do is leaf through it real quick. And what you'll see is when somebody's reading through their Bible, like we encourage people to read through from front to back. And the reason we do that, and I've come up with this word, and I believe it works. I said, when you read your Bible daily, you learn how to collate it. What do you mean collate? I, you learn how to you learn how to find where things are and how they relate to each other. And you put things in the right order. That's collation. And, and so what I'm saying is when I pick somebody's Bible up, I can tell they read their Bible daily and how they're reading through it. Because all you got to do is go through it and look at notes that they're making. And what you'll see is that they're reading them go, you know, now it takes a while to do this. But when you're reading in Genesis chapter, say, uh, Genesis chapter 12, or I'm, I'm sorry, say Exodus chapter 11 and 12, where it talks about uh, them sacrificing a, a lamb and putting, taking the blood and putting it on a doorpost. You'll see anybody who reads that very often will all of a sudden say, wait a minute, that relates to Christ. And so they'll have notes in there that are showing how Christ is the sacrificial lamb. And, so, and you can do that everywhere in your Bible. You can read many things, like, like where I just said here. You can read the account of how when it says, and the woman saw that the tree was good and, and that it was pleasant to the eyes and the tree to make, be desired to make one wise. You put a little note there that says, look at 1 John uh, chapter 3, verse 8. That's what John was talking about. 1 John. And so that's like collating your scriptures. And that's why we encourage people, take, their, take God's word and read through it daily, and you can start to walk with God daily in the cool of the garden. Now, of course, it depends on where you read your Bible. Christine, she walks with God daily uh, uh, at the foot of our pullet stove. Amen. I walk with God daily in our bed. We have a little back room back by the, uh, closer to the river. I, I sit in that little room, and I walk with God daily in that room. So what I'm saying is wherever you've chosen to, to read God's word daily and collate his scriptures and, and learn from him, that's where you walk daily with him, you see. You learn how to put line upon line and precept upon precept. You learn how to systematically uh, speak to God and see what he's saying to us and how that applies to us, you see. And what's amazing is this. And that last point is the digression from the truth. So, so what happened to Adam and Eve is, is how they became, uh, how the critical spirit come out of them was, of course, Satan tempted Eve. And she, she turned away from God's word. She turned away from it. And, and not only did she turn away from God's word, but then she looked at the benefits of, of being exalted. Well, I could be like God. Of course, she realizes now that was not possible, or realized that, realized shortly after she took a bite of that forbidden fruit that it was not possible. But she let that desire get the best of her. And then what happened is, she did, they digressed from the truth. They hid from God, you see. And, and so in closing, the rest of the verse says, and Adam and his wife, uh, it says, and he hid themselves from the presence of the Lord. Now, and so that's kind of a warning to us how not to become a critical spirit. Now, what about, what about if you're the victim of a critical spirit? As I said, it's, not, it, it, it's pretty well expected that if you're following God, you're going to become the victim of a critical spirit. A few years ago, and I already kind of mentioned this a, a couple points ago, a few years ago, um, I flew down for a funeral. My, my sons and I flew down for, for a funeral of a man that we had never met. Oh, we had seen him. We had been in some meetings where he was. And he really didn't even preach at that time. He kind of spoke a little bit. And uh, he was kind of the, uh, the um, how would you say it, the pastor of the church that was having the meeting. And so he got up and spoke, but he didn't really preach or anything. And so we went down to this funeral of this man we'd never met. 
You might think, well, that's weird. Why would you do that? Well, that same man, through his writings about the Bible, taught me to respect God's Word. And I learned, I, I learned more in a few years of reading after his writings and what he says about the Bible and how to, how to apply that, his teachings in my Bible study and whatnot. I learned more in just a few years of reading his stuff than I would have a lifetime of going to Bible college. And so I appreciated, appreciated him for that. And I, I wanted to pay homage to him and go to his funeral. So that's why we did it. But what I, what I wanted to say about this man is he became the brunt of a critical spirit. For near all his life, he was attacked for his stand on the Bible. And it was by men who, when you look at what was done here and how Satan tempted Adam and Eve, that really those men are the same, same kind of, uh, in the same kind of position to where they were tempted just like Adam and Eve. And, and became critical, became a critical spirit. And so this man was the brunt of critical spirits for near all his life. But he always had the attitude of a Paul. And that's how we have to handle a critical spirit. I mean, we, we, we do the opposite. We don't digress from the truth. We turn to God's word. We don't, we don't have a desire to be exalted. We desire God to be exalted. And so we do everything that we can uh, to do that. And we don't, we don't turn from God's word. We read God's word daily. So you see, we can take the exact points that make someone a critical spirit and turn them away from God uh, and, and, and take those same points and say, if I do those correctly, then I won't be a critical spirit and I'll depend on God. And that's kind of the attitude that, that this man had. This man was brought a critical spirit for near all his life because of his stand on the Bible. But he had the attitude of Paul. And I'll close with this. Because here's what Paul said. 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 23. He said, Are they ministers of Christ? I speak as a fool. I'm, I'm more, and labor's more abundant, stripes above measure, in prisons more frequent, and death oft. Of the Jews five times received I forty stripes, save one. So here's a man who's being beaten for his stand for God. And he says, uh, 40 stripes, I was, uh, for five times received by 40 stripes, save one. Thrice I was beat with rods, once I was stoned, thrice I suffered shipwreck. A night and a day I had been in the deep, in journeys often in perils of waters, in perils of robbers, in perils by mine own countrymen, in perils by the heathen, in perils in the city. So what I'm saying is no matter what you do, if you follow God, you're going to catch it from every critical spirit out there. No matter where they come from. You're going to catch it from people who are not saved, who hate everything that you're about, as far as if you stand for God. You're going to catch it from church people, uh, godly people, who think that they're, uh, they're following God, but you're doing it different than them. And you can prove them wrong with the Bible, so what they're going to be is a critical spirit and turn against you in everything that they can. That's kind of what Ruck, happened to Ruck, because he knew the Bible. And what they, what they did is because they wanted his authority. His authority was the Bible. And, and what they didn't realize is you can't have his authority. His authority comes from God's word. And so when you stand on God's word, there's your authority right there. There's your, there's your how would I say it? There's your ammunition to control or to combat any critical spirit out there. Is as long as you stand by God's word. It's the exact opposite that Adam and Eve did. Because of their desire to be exalted, they digress from God's word. And so here's Paul. And he says, I've taken a meeting from everybody, my own countrymen, and perils by the heathen, and perils in the city, and perils in the wilderness, and perils in the sea, and perils among false brethren. That's talking about people in every one of those situations. And he said, if I must needs, needs glory, I glory of the things which concern my infirmities. But here's how he concludes it. The God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which is blessed forevermore, knoweth that I lie not. So what he was saying is, let them do what they got to do. But I'm going to stick by God. Amen. And so that's the exact same thing that we have to do. If we encounter a critical spirit, all we do is stick by God's truth and say, don't know what to tell you. 
I'm just going to believe what God says. Amen. And so, that's how we deal with the criminal spirit. Whether it be in ourselves or whether it be aimed at us from others. We have to stick by God. Amen. Father, we're grateful, Lord. I pray that you bless us. And give us a, a good time uh, at the altar tonight, Lord. Give us a good uh, invitation time. And Lord, if there's someone here, Lord, that is struggling with your truth, Lord, I'm not saying they have a critical spirit, whether they do or not, I don't know. But I know this, Lord, we've learned something that we, that when it comes down to whatever's going on in our lives, Lord, we need to turn to you and trust in your word. Trust in our walks with you in the cool of the day. And Lord, if we haven't, if we don't have a walk with you every day, then Lord, I encourage our folks to be able to, to, to know exactly what to do to do that. We talked about it, Lord, getting into our your word, our, our Bibles. And so, Lord, I pray that you help us. Maybe there's someone here, Lord, that's struggling in an area. Lord, maybe they've become critical. Or, Lord, maybe they've been, and maybe they're tired of the critical spirit against them because of their stand for you. And then I pray that they have continued to stick by the stuff and do as like what Paul said. That we're on the winning side. And that, Lord, we need to stick with you. And so what a blessing it is, Lord. I pray that you continue to bless us and grow us closer to you. And again, maybe someone wants to come tonight. Lord, I pray that you help them. So bless us, Lord, in this invitation. I pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Brother Chris, you're going to lead us in the invitation. Three fifty-five.